rho n goes to infinity, right, the, the samples, uh, the frequency components that you take uh, become denser and denser and denser and eventually converges to the continuum of all frequency components within a period of 2 pi, okay? So when you extend from periodic, discrete time periodic signals to aperiodic signals, now each signal is written as a linear combination of a continuum of frequency components within a period of 2 pi, okay? So uh, this is called the synthesis equation because you can synthesize the signal xn through this continuum uh, linear combination of frequency components. And this is called, uh, this, uh, this discrete time Fourier transform here is called the analysis equation because you can use this equation to extract out, you know, how much of the frequency omega is embedded within uh, the signal xn, okay? So this is your discrete time Fourier transform pair. Okay. Now, notation-wise, uh, we use uh, for the Fourier for the spectrum of the discrete time case, we use this uh, x of e to the j omega, okay, instead of this x of j omega in the continuous time case. Okay, so just just by looking at the notation, you should be aware of you know whether we're looking at discrete time or continuous time. Okay. And last time we uh, started to look through a few properties of this discrete time Fourier transform pair. Almost all of them are the same as the continuous time case, okay? So we went through uh, many of these properties. So this included things like linearity, time and frequency shifting, uh, conjugation, differencing, and so on, okay? So the only thing that's, you know, sort of unique to the discrete time case is this periodicity, okay? So uh, in discrete time, uh, the Fourier transform is periodic with period 2 pi, right? And this is, uh, the, you know, this is not, this periodicity does not exist in continuous time, okay? In continuous time, you can potentially include frequency components that go to infinity. Okay. All right, so we looked at several of these, right? Conjugation, differencing. Uh, we looked at accumulation, time reversal, time expansion, okay? And uh, we ended with this example uh, that utilizes time expansion, okay? Um, all right, so uh, let's continue. We have a few uh, more properties left. Uh, one is uh, dif differentiation uh, in frequency, okay? So this is very much like what we have in continuous time as well. All right, so here it says that if you have a signal xn, uh, which has a Fourier transform, that is this capital X, then the derivative, right, of the, of the frequency domain, right, uh, multiplied by j uh, gives you, in the time domain, n times x of n. Okay, so you could have actually, you know, written this j uh, on the other side, right? Multiply both sides by minus j, uh, which could give you something that's more, uh, f more uh, familiar, uh, as we see in the continuous time uh, example. Okay, so you could also write this as minus j n x n. dx e to the j omega d omega, okay? So this is what we wrote. Uh, this is the form that we used in continuous time, right? In continuous time, we had this minus jt, x of t, you know, uh, transforming to the derivative of x of j omega, okay? Um, so to show this, it's, actually, you know, quite straightforward, right? You can just, you first write out the relationship, uh, the Fourier transform a relationship, and then take the derivative and you'll get the result, okay? So uh, in particular, 
Uh, you can start out with this Fourier transform relationship, all right, which is summation of xn e to the minus j omega n, and from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, and then you can take the derivative on both sides. All right, so in this case, on the left-hand side, you have the derivative of capital X with respect to omega. And then on the right-hand side, right, when you take the derivative uh, with respect to omega, you get a minus Jn brought down to the front. All right. So I have this summation, minus Jn xn, e to the minus j omega n. OK? And then you uh, immediately get this result here, right? Because this is in the form of the Fourier transform of this signal here. So this tells you that the Fourier transform of this signal, which is the left-hand side here, has a uh, spectrum that is the derivative of x. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, all right. So hence, this minus j n x n has a Fourier transform that is the derivative of capital X. And the last uh, property is the Parsevals relation. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to show that here, but you can show this easily fo following you know, similar approaches as before. So this basically says that you know, the, the energy in the time domain uh, is equal to the energy in the frequency domain. OK? All right. So let's uh, look at. Okay, let's look at uh, an example. Okay, so uh, in this example, you start out with this spectrum, capital X, which is given here. Okay, so here we have the magnitude of the spectrum, right? This, is, this looks symmetric, right? And you have a face, right, that is uh, linear, okay? All right, so uh, you have this... Uh, Fourier transform, capital X, uh, but note that this, because this is the Fourier transform of a discrete time signal, so this is periodic, right? So here I'm only plotting this for one period, but actually it should repeat every two pi, okay? Now the question asks you to determine whether or not Xn is periodic, real, even, and of finite energy, okay? Now, is it periodic? Uh, is the time domain signal periodic? Okay. Uh, so, how many of you think it's periodic? Uh, so, how many think it's not periodic? It's aperiodic. Okay. <laughs> not very sure. Okay. So why do you think it's not periodic? periodic? <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, uh, 你说, 你说这里不连续吗? Uh, uh, so, uh, 
跟这个连续不连续有一点关系，对，不过呃呃不完全是因为这个这个地方，对，不过很好猜测，嗯、啊，你是要猜吗？还是深蓝要？啊，好好好，请说。对对对，呃对对对，哎这个超赞的，对，啊，对对对，所以就是这样子 ，OK， 所以你如果是 periodic signal 的话，你就会有一个 Fourier series representation， right？ 那 Fourier series representation 就是 sum 这个 discrete number of frequency components。So if you take the Fourier transform of that， you will see that it should be， you know。Several impulses, right, in the frequency domain. So because this has a you know、uh, continuous spectrum, right, it's not simply a bunch of impulses. Therefore, this is not periodic. Now, how about real, right? Is it real? Uh, it's not just a continuous spectrum. It's got to be 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 a continuous spectrum. Frequency component, so then go to like this, like this. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. But, yeah. If you say, if you want to grow like that, then. 其实，你这个 face 大概就是得要，呃，在这个间隔中间，可能都要是，是都要是什么才会是零？呃，零的话就是一嘛，对不对？对，应该是。主要是 magnitude 一定要是零啊，要不然你乘上什么 f a c e 好像都不会是零这样子。对对对，谢谢。好，嗯、啊、，OK， 好，那是不是 real？ OK， so what does it take for the continuous time to be real？ Um， so this is by the conjugation property， right？ So if the signal is real。Then the spectrum must be conjugate symmetric, okay. And if you look at this, this is indeed conjugate symmetric, right? This is indeed conjugate symmetric. The magnitude is symmetric, and the phase is odd, okay. So yes, x n is real. Then the spectrum is conjugate symmetric. Okay. Now, is it even? Is it even? Okay. So it is actually not even、uh, because if this, if the time domain signal is both real and even, then this means that the spectrum must also be real and even. Okay, but this spectrum is not even because of the phase. 
right? So no xn is not even since is not real and even. OK? All right. So the last one is, is easy. All right. So how many of you think it's uh, finite energy? How many of you think it's finite energy? How many of you think it's not finite energy? How many of you don't know? How many of you don't care? <laughs> okay. So it's, it's finite energy because of Parseval's relation. All right. So the energy in the time domain is equal to the energy in the frequency domain. So because this spans a finite area with finite magnitude. Therefore, the spectrum, if you integrate the spectrum, it's finite, and therefore, the time domain energy must also be finite. OK? So yes, finite energy by Parseval's relation. OK? OK, good. So here we introduce several of these you know, basic uh, properties of the discrete time Fourier transform. OK. So continuing to the second part, uh, we still have this convolution and related multiplication properties. OK. All right. So the next property is convolution. All right, so similar to the continuous time case, I, you know, um, I put this in a separate slide because this is very important for studying the input-output relation of a linear time invariant system. Okay, so the convolution property says that if you have convolution between two signals in discrete time, then the Fourier transform will give you something that is equal to the multiplication of their respective uh, Fourier. Uh, Fourier domain uh, signals, OK? All right, so this is the same as continuous time. Uh, we can look at several examples. So all of these examples that we will see in a moment, we've also seen in the continuous time, OK? So we start out with this case where we have a linear time invariant system where the impulse response is simply this, you know, this shifted uh, delta function, OK? So to find. Um, all right, to find, suppose you're asked to find the output uh, of this uh, system, okay, for an arbitrary input. So to utilize the convolution property, we start out by finding the frequency response. So the frequency response is h e to the j omega equal to summation delta n minus n naught e to the minus j omega n. OK? And this gives you e to the minus j omega n naught, right? Because this, this impulse is 1 only when n is equal to n naught and zero everywhere else, OK? So then suppose you have an input, right, some arbitrary input, xn, 
that has a Fourier transform capital X e to the j omega. Okay? And then in this case, the output by, by convolution property, we know that the output should be equal to the frequency response times the input. Okay? And if you plug in the frequency response, this is e to the minus j omega n naught x e to the j omega. Right. Now by this time shifting property, we know that if you multiply a spectrum by this linear phase shift, then what you have in the frequency do, uh, in the time domain is the time shifted version of the, its corresponding signal x. Okay. So by time shifting property. The output signal is just the input shifted by a knot. Okay? All right, so we're just going through these examples again for discrete time, uh, but we've seen, uh, you know, We've seen similar cases in continuous time already. Okay. So the next one uh, is this low pass filter. Okay. So here consider, uh, assume that you have this, this discrete time ideal low pass filter uh, with a spectrum that looks like this. Okay. And you want to see what the time domain signal looks like. Okay. So in this case, you can apply the inverse Fourier transform formula to get the impulse response. Which is 1 over 2 pi minus pi to pi h e to the j omega e to the j omega n d omega. Okay? So you can use this inverse for your transform to find uh, the impulse response. And, uh, you know, this is just a constant one between minus omega c to omega c. So I can plug in one, limit the integral from minus omega c to omega c. And if you work this out, you will get this uh, sync like function uh, similar to before. Okay? So this is the corresponding uh, time domain impulse response uh, that you get. Okay. Right. Now, other than looking at this, you know, ideal low pass filter, right, sometimes we can use a less ideal low pass filter, such as the one given by, uh, given by this uh, decaying uh, exponential here. Okay. So in this case, we assume we have a, you know, linear time invariant system with the impulse response given by this, and assume that we pass a input that is also a decaying exponential, right, into this system. And you want, you're asked to find what is the output signal, okay? Right, so to utilize the convolution property, we first find the, uh, the Fourier transform of both of these, okay? 
So we've done this before uh, in the previous example 5.1. So let me just write out the, the answer for this. So alpha n u n has a spectrum that is 1 over 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega. And xn has a spectrum that is 1 over 1 minus beta e to the minus j omega. OK? So see example 5.1. So by convolution property, right, the output spectrum is just the multiplication of these two. So hence, y e to the j omega is equal to h e to the j omega times x e to the j omega. And this gives you 1 over 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega times 1 minus beta e to the minus j omega. OK. So then what do you do now, right? So now you have this, this uh, output spectrum. How do you convert it to the time domain signal? Okay. Yeah, so this form looks very familiar. Right? So similar to the continuous time case, the way we do it is by using partial fraction expansion to split it into two terms that give us, uh, you know, that, that give us a spectrum of this type, OK? So once we can get a spectrum of this form, we know immediately what is the inverse uh, transform, OK? So, uh, Let's first look at the case for alpha not equal to beta. Okay. So for alpha not equal to beta, right, e to the uh, y of e to the j omega, by partial fraction expansion, you can split into two terms, a over 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega plus b over 1 minus beta e to the minus j omega. OK? And what, how do you find A and B, right? So you try to combine both of these so that you have a common you know, denominator as this term here. And then you try to make the numerator equal to 1, OK? So if you combine the two, uh, you get A minus A beta e to the minus J omega plus B minus alpha uh, b alpha e to the minus j omega over 1 minus alpha e to the power minus j omega and 1 minus beta e to the minus j omega. OK? All right, so I'm just combining these two terms, right? So in the numerator, you have A times this, which gives you this, and you have B times this, which gives you this, OK? All right, so the numerator needs to be equal to 1, right? So A plus B is 1, and this means that B, uh, A beta plus B alpha must be 0, OK? So this means that A plus B B is 1, and A beta plus B alpha is 0, OK? So if you solve this you know, system of linear equations, you can find that A is alpha over alpha minus beta, and B is minus beta over alpha minus beta. OK? So it, you can easily check that this is true, right? If you plug this inside this formula, it's 1. Right? If you plug this inside here, right, you have this alpha beta. And plug it inside here, you have minus beta alpha, 
which cancels out, so it's zero. Okay. Okay. So if you plug A and B back into this formula here, you have the spectrum of Y as a summation of uh, these two, you know, special types of spectrum. Okay. So you can, if you plug this back, okay, you will get y equal to alpha over alpha minus beta minus beta alpha minus beta. Okay. All right. So having a spectrum of this form, we know immediately what is the time domain signal. Okay. So the inverse Fourier transform of this gives you a decaying exponential with this factor alpha, and this gives you a decaying exponential with factor beta. So if you plug that in, you get yn, that is alpha over alpha minus beta, alpha n, un, minus beta, alpha minus beta, beta n, un. Okay? Now that you have these common terms, uh, one minus beta and this u n, so you can further, you know, uh, combine these two terms to get one over alpha minus beta, alpha to the power n plus one, uh, minus beta to the power n plus one, u n. Okay. All right. So you know the, the the procedure that we use to arrive at this solution is exactly the same as what we did in continuous time. Okay. Now this is for the case where you know alpha is not equal to beta, but what if alpha is equal to beta? If alpha is equal to beta, then we would have, you know, 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega squared instead of these two terms that we can separate, okay? So the technique is also the same as before. So for alpha equal to beta, we have y, that is 1 over 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega squared. Okay. Now, if you recall, what is the what is the technique here? All right. The technique here is that to to get this square in the denominator, you can view this as some scale of the derivative. The scale of the derivative of this this function. Okay. So you just have to sort of uh, pick the right scale which is you know, pretty straightforward uh, by looking at the derivative. So eventually you can write this as 1 over alpha e to the j omega, j d over d omega, 1 over 1 minus, 1 minus alpha e to the minus j omega. Okay. So again, the key to getting a square here is by taking the derivative of this first order term. Okay. Now, certainly, when you take the derivative, you will have to bring out bring out some some you know scale factor, right? You have this alpha, you have the j, right? And you will have an exponential uh, j omega remaining. So you have to pick this accordingly so that you cancel out what comes out. OK? 
Okay. All right. So you know, with this relationship, uh, we then know how to deal with this problem, right? Because uh, by the frequency differentiation property, okay, we know that you know since. We know that since this and this forms a Fourier transform pair, therefore, if I take j times the derivative of this, it should have a time domain signal that is n times alpha n u n. Okay? So since this, we have n alpha n u n. That is a Fourier that has a Fourier transform equal to the derivative of this term. Okay. So we know that this term here, this term here, has a Fourier transform that is this. Okay. Now you also need to see, you know, what is multiplied in front of this term. Okay. So you have a scale of one over alpha, right? That's no problem. It's just a constant scale. But you also have uh, multiplied by this e to the j omega. Okay. So when you multiply with this e to the j omega, right? This linear phase shift in the frequency domain. This corresponds to a time shift in the time domain. Okay? So e to the j omega is like e to the j omega times 1. Okay? So this means that in the time domain, you need to shift the time by 1. So instead of n, you will have n plus 1. Okay? So hence, yn will be equal to this constant scale, 1 over alpha, times this uh, formula shifted by 1. OK? Now you can cancel out one of the alphas from here. So this becomes. n plus 1 alpha n u n plus 1. Now, if you look at this, this unit uh, step function here, this unit step function is of you know, n plus 1, meaning that it is non-zero starting from n equal to minus 1. Right? So this is non-zero starting from n equal to minus 1 right? to n0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2, so on and so forth. OK? But when n is equal to minus 1, this is actually 0. OK? So this whole thing is still 0 when n is equal to minus 1. So, we, so this whole thing can only be non-zero, actually starting from n that is equal to 0 instead of minus 1. OK? So you can actually write this as n plus 1 
alpha to the power n u of n instead. Okay. So again, the reason we can write it like this is because originally, right, we're saying that this thing is multiplied by something that is non-zero, right, only starting from n equal to minus one. But when n is minus one, this first term is actually zero anyway, so it doesn't really matter. We can still start from zero, okay? Okay. All right, so uh, this problem is, you know, very much the same as what we did in continuous time, right? It's just that, you know, we're dealing with, uh, we're dealing with this thing where we write, uh, where we have this e to the minus j omega uh, here instead, okay? Okay. 